Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hello, disembodied voices. I can't see you yet. There you are. All right, good afternoon. Good afternoon. So let's see. Uh, no guys, we're missing uh, Denon and Brett today? Yeah. And we're missing Chloe in Winslow? Yeah. All right. And we got the four horsemen of St. John's there, right? Yes. Awesome. All right. So it sounds like, at least from the emails, that some of you have had an interesting day with drug dogs and internet going out and Moodle going out and anyway I guess all those things just are to give us experience all right let me take roll and see what uh... okay so we've got no denim no Hey, uh, Denon's here now. Oh, Denon's here? Okay, thanks. And who else? Oh, Chloe. Chloe. All right. Okay, so um, so I Miss uh, Townsend uh, emailed me about, uh, I guess, uh, given uh, Mogion needed some more time, you guys... Uh, I hope you all, uh, none of you have drugs uh, in your possession because that's bad. You, you, the drug dog hits on you. And you and anyway, um, I, had a, I had a situation once when I was teaching in high school where uh, they had the a drug dog suite. And because I was on my planning period, they used my classroom as like the holding cell. All right. And... Um, I don't know if they, I mean, they, the first guy that they went and took in there, I don't know if he just thought I was stupid or what, but as soon as the cop leaves, he like digs into his um, socks for a flip phone and then he just starts texting people like crazy. And so then I go and tell the cop, I said, uh, did you didn't take this guy's phone from him or whatever. And they were like, well, we were kind of hoping that he would be stupid enough to warn his buddies. So it implicated him in the whole thing. And they were able to shut down the whole drug ring because this guy was texting while he was in my classroom about all of the, the drugs they had stashed through the school. Anyway, it was kind of funny. But anyway, nothing that exciting. So um, let's see. And then um, if, uh, was it... Uh, so then, Nathan, I think you said you had some some issues. Did they ever get resolved with the Moodle? Yeah, yeah. I got it. Okay. So, but do you need time for your second attempt or anything like that? No, I finished everything. Uh, after like 20 minutes, it popped back on. So I was able okay. to finish. All right. Well, very good. All right. Um, okay. So let's see. What else? Um Okay, well, today we're going to uh, here, let me put this in. We're going to go on to four or five. Does, does anyone have any questions, comments, concerns before we get started? Did you set up me and Chloe to test for tomorrow at 930? Oh, it's tomorrow at 930. Yeah, why did I think it was right after school today? So all three, all three quizzes tomorrow at 930. Okay, now I did it wrong. I set it up for after school. I don't know why. Also, we are not done on 4-4 yet. 
Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. So Winslow, 9.30. All right. And let's go to 4.4. Four, four. Let's see what we have left to do. Oh, yeah. We still had quite a bit to do on 4.4. On four, four. I was getting confused with my morning class. Okay, so we're on practice six. Okay, so let's work through this one together. Okay, it says a particle is moving along a horizontal line with position function given for t is greater than or equal to zero. What find the velocity and acceleration of the particle? All right, so let's uh, go through that. So. All right, so David, what would be the velocity function? I still haven't done this yet. I wasn't here yesterday. Okay, uh, all right. Well, you could probably do it right now in your head without even writing anything down. But you can write stuff down if you want. Given the position function, how do you find the velocity function? Find the velocity, you take the derivative of that equation. Okay, so tell me what that is. Yeah, yes, it's 9t squared minus 30t plus 20. All right, and then the acceleration equation. All right, Nathan, what would the acceleration be? 18t minus 30. Good. All right, any questions on either of those? Okay, so when, okay, now this, uh, I think you ought to add this question to your, um, to your paper. Uh, it says, when is the particle slowing down or speeding up? So there, when it's slowing down, that's when the acceleration is negative. It's decelerating. When it's speeding up, that's when the acceleration is positive. Okay? So, um, so see if you can figure that out. All right, so Skylar, when is it slowing down?
All right, are you stuck? Need some help? Yeah. Okay, so for the acceleration, to find out where it's positive and negative, it's like using the um, second derivative test that we were doing yesterday. Okay, so you find out first, where is the second derivative zero? So you take the acceleration and set that equal to zero and solve. So that gives you 5 thirds. So 5 thirds is your possible point of inflection. So you do 5 thirds. And now this is like the second derivative test where you're trying to figure out where is it positive, where is it negative. So between, now the, now the function is only good starting at zero. So you start, go from zero to 5 thirds. So you plug in a number into the second derivative or the acceleration. So let's say 1. Well, 18 times 1 minus 30, whoops, that's negative. And then you plug in a number bigger than 5 thirds, say 2. 18 times 2 minus 30, that's positive. So then if the, where the acceleration is negative, that's where it's slowing down. So the object is slowing down the first 5 thirds seconds. Then it's speeding up. The acceleration is positive. So you would say it, the object is speeding up after 5 thirds seconds. All right. Any questions on that? Okay, so um, this is this. You can also we we've just been doing the second derivative to find the change in concavity, the point of inflection. Okay, we can also use the second derivative to find the local extrema. Okay, so what we mean, so the relative max and min. We found those before with the first derivative test, but we can, we can also use the second derivative test. It's kind of like this. If you know that you have a local extrema, a max or a min, and the graph is concave down, then it has to be a local max. Or if it's concave up, then you know that your critical point has to be a local min. Okay? So this is the idea. So if the second derivative is continuous on the interval, and if the first derivative is zero, so that means you have a critical point. If the second derivative is negative, then it's concave down, so you've got to have a local max. All right, if the second derivative is zero and the second, if the first derivative is zero and the second derivative is positive, then that means it's concave up and you have a local min there. Okay? So you'll have a local max. A local min. And then the third one, if the derivative is zero and the second derivative is zero, the test fails because that would be if where the second derivative is zero, that means you might have an inflection point. So you wouldn't have necessarily a max or a min. So we say the test fails in that situation. You could have a local max, a local min, or neither in that situation. Okay.
All right. So um, for this part right here, um, you can actually um, write this under the using a graphing strategy under part eight. Okay. So I guess I'll change. So, okay. Um, it, it's, I've changed the labeling. Um, so for, instead of uh, one, one through seven under the graphing strategy, um, you can just start with A. I think it's A through, A through F. A through E. Well, anyway, so I, I've changed kind of how I labeled it here. But uh, um, so, okay, so to help us grab, how do you find, if you're asked to find the extrema, okay, what do you do? So, so for number one, just write down, identify extrema. And then, and then next to it, I want you to write down kind of what's the process. What, what do you do? How do you identify the max and the mins? The, let's start with the local. How do you identify the local max and the mins? Sign chart. Okay, for what? The function, the first derivative, the second derivative. First, the first derivative. The first derivative. Or we just learned you can also use the second derivative. Okay? But typically what I do is you've got to find the critical points. That's where you're, get, you're checking. And then so you do that when you're doing the sign chart. So it's where the first derivative is zero or undefined. All right, second one. Find the intervals where the function is increasing or decreasing. So what do you do there? You plug the second derivative, derivative into the sign chart when you do the sign chart thing? For the second derivative? No. The second derivative sign chart tells you where about the concavity, where it's concave up and concave down. Okay? It's where the first derivative is positive. That's where the function is increasing. And where the first derivative is negative, that's where the function is decreasing. Okay. All right, so find where the function is concave up and down. So what do we do there? Uh, basically what Denon just said when you have the <laughs> right. second derivative. You know, Devin always gives the right, I mean, Denon always gives the right answer. It just might be to a different problem. That's it. Okay. So, yeah. So, concave up is where the second derivative is positive. Concave down where the second derivative is negative. Okay, now, when you're doing the general, uh, general graph, okay, it says, uh, don't forget the function dance. So, um, that's where you look at even positive, odd, negative, that kind of stuff. Do you remember the function dance moves? If the function, if the exponent, so, so that's, so what is this? Uh, positive x squared. Even positive. So like this x squared, so the, the squared is even, positive. Okay, so what's this? 
negative even. Okay, and this odd positive and even positive. odd negative. Odd negative. Okay, so you want to uh, remember those. That can help you do the general graph. Okay, I won't. I won't write those down again. Okay, then where it says plot specific points. Some specific points that you find are like the um, point of inflection. You plug that, once you get that x value, you plug it in to, to the original function to get the y value. And then like any uh, local max and mins that you find, any intercepts, find those. And so that's kind of what we do. Those are the points that we find uh, that I might expect you to do without a calculator. All of that I expect you to do without a calculator, okay? So what I would like you to do is, um, so on practice seven, it goes through these same steps, all right? And so I wanted to go through it first, kind of reminding you what you do at each step, but now I want you to do it with that specific example and see if you can graph it without a calculator, okay? Or only use your calculator just to, like, double-check your, your final answer, okay? All right, so Jordan, when you've got A, let us know. I got a critical point at x equals one third. I 
Actually, there is no critical point here. Because when you take the derivative and set it equal to zero, there's no solution. Okay? Because the only solutions you get uh, would be complex numbers, and we're not graphing complex numbers here. We're not dealing with complex numbers. Okay? So what I'm doing here in green, Jordan, is I, I checked the discriminant of using the, of the quadratic formula, and b squared minus 4ac is negative. So I knew right then, I didn't even have to solve the whole thing, is I knew if I had two complex solutions, they're not going to graph. So I'm not going to get any extrema. Okay? So there's no local max or mins. Nothing. Okay? All right, so do you see where you made your mistake on that? I um, don't know. Well, I did something wrong in the math, and I know what I did, but I don't know how to describe what I did, but I know how to not do it, if that makes sense. <laughs> okay, so, but you did get the derivative right. Yes, so I have the derivative right. I just did something weird when taking it equal to zero. Okay, okay. All right, so, but there is no solution. The, the graph of the derivative doesn't ever cross the x-axis. There, there are no, no place, there's no place where the derivative is zero or undefined. So there's no extrema, so no local max or mins. Okay. All right, so Skylar, where is the function increasing or decreasing? Uh, I'm stuck on that part. Okay, so where the function is increasing is where the derivative is positive. Well, this is the derivative right here, and this is the graph of the derivative. And the derivative here is always, always positive, okay? So if the derivative is always positive and ne never negative, then that means... The function is always increasing from negative infinity to infinity and never decreasing. All right. Next, the concavity. All right. So, Skylar, when you've got that one, we want to figure out where the graph is concave up or concave down.
um, concave up from negative infinity to two thirds and concave down from two thirds to infinity. That's it. Good job. Okay, so you take the second derivative, set it equal to zero, and then do, you do your sign chart for the second derivative. So where the second derivative is negative, it's concave down. Where the second derivative is positive, it's concave up. Okay? Any questions on that? All right. So, Skylar, what's the... Looking at this original function, what's the function dance move for this? What's the general the 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 general shape of this graph? So the outer or the end behavior. What do you mean? So like where we did the function dance, the like this, like this, like this, like this. What what would be the end behavior for this graph? So I know we first talked about this in chapter one. It's been a while. So, but this is where where you look at the leading term. And you say the exponent is odd, and then it's positive. So odd positive. So do you remember that how that looks like odd positive? Okay. So that's your right. The right. Your right hand is up. Your left hand is down. So that's the general shape of the function. So it's the right hand up. Okay. So um, uh, David, it's your, it's your right hand that goes up, not your left. Okay. He, he was holding his right hand up. We're just mirrored. Oh, oh, okay. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. All right. So, so it's it's gonna be positive up and negative down. Okay. Now, when we have uh, so now we have uh, points, specific points like intercepts. Let's see. There were no max and mins. We do have. Uh, a point of inflection so you can plug that into the original function uh, let's see you can find intercepts so let's start with the point of inflection we know that it occurs at x equals two-thirds okay so now is where you could use your calculator here so if you plug in two-thirds into the original function, what's the y value that goes with that when x is two thirds? Okay, so David, when you've got that. So I want to know what's the y value for x equals two thirds in the original function. Negative 2.592. Okay, so negative 2.592 or, yeah, actually I like your answer better it, because it's easier to graph as a decimal than it is a fraction, okay? So, uh, so that would be your, y, your uh, point of inflection, okay? Now the next uh, easiest point would be the y-intercept, so plug in 0 for x. And David, what's the y-intercept? Plug in zero for x in the original function. Negative four. Negative four. So as all of these terms will go away and you'll just have negative four, for your y-intercept, so that's a set another point that we have, okay? Uh, and now the x-intercept, it's only gonna cross once, 
Okay, so now to find the x-intercept, you set the whole equation equal to zero and solve. Or if you want to put it in your calculator and do second calc zero and find the intercept that way. Okay. All right, so Jordan, when you've got the x-intercept. Uh, y, or sorry, x is equal to, I can't talk today, sorry, <laughs> point, or no, <laughs> this isn't working, 1.65. Okay, good. All right, so there's our, um, there's our three points that will help us. So, zero, negative four, and then we've got our, uh, our point of inflection was at uh, five thirds negative, or was it five thirds? Two thirds. Like it doesn't look like five thirds on the graph. Two thirds and then negative 2.593. And then the x intercept. That Jordan just found 1.651 comma zero. Okay, so you graph those. You have the end behavior, odd positive, and that's pretty dang good. That's that's a that's a pretty accurate graph. Okay. All right. Any questions? All right, so part practice eight uh, and part nine, uh, we're, well, we're just going to skip the rest of that, okay? It's just, just review of stuff we've done before, okay? All right. Um, so any questions on that last uh, practice problem or anything here in 4.4? Okay, well, let's go ahead and do, um, go on to four or five. Okay, so 4.5 in some way, well, well let me just uh, tell you, I went to, uh, years ago I went to a uh, calculus, it was kind of an extended conference. It was my first year teaching calculus, and I was in a room with college professors from 
all over. And they were talking about their tricks to teaching calculus. And, and I was fascinated with the idea that, that they thought that this was the most important topic in all of Calc 1, optimization. Okay, so applied optimization, what that means is it's application problems of maximum and minimums. Okay, so why do you think, why do you think that that would be such an important topic? At least in the minds of calculus teachers. Any guesses as to why finding maximum and minimums would be so important in real life? Business. Okay, in business. We've talked about some, some applications, but in the real world, you're always trying to maximize or minimize something in your life. Maximize your time, maximize your test scores, maximize your profit maximize your earnings or minimize the cost minimize the wasted time minimize whatever and so in business and industry and whatever a lot of engineering is all about maximizing and minimizing and so this is an important an important idea it's not it's not necessarily the most difficult but the i the most the math part is finding derivatives and we've done that before and so that part hopefully is not going to be an issue for you okay so in business and industry to optimize something means to do the best possible whatever that means so to be most efficient to get the bang for your buck to maximize efficiency to maximize profit minimize loss Okay, or uh, maybe minimize uh, waste. Okay, so those are some of the things that you would do. If you're called in as a project engineer, those are some of the things that you would be asked to try to calculate. Okay. All right, so in this first example, what we're doing is we're trying to um, maximize the volume. Now, this, in my mind, I call this the, the microwave browning pan example. Um, I don't know, have any of you ever made microwave brownies? Well, it used to be a big deal, okay? And then it turned out that people started tasting them and they're pretty awful. But, I mean, compared to a regular brownie, a microwave brownie, I wouldn't recommend it. But this is kind of how it worked, is that you'd come with, they would package it with this flat piece of like shiny silvery material. And then you would fold it up in such a way to make a little mini brownie pan, okay? So kind of like this idea here, only in this we're talking about like a cardboard box or something. And you're cutting off out the corners and folding them up to make this um, volume of the, this uh, using a square sheet of tin or cardboard or whatever. You fold it up and it'll make a volume. So what you're trying to do is say, well, given this specific the specific dimensions of uh, material, what volume, what's the maximum volume you could produce, okay? All right, so if you look practice one, what I'm asking you to do is to write the formula for the volume, okay? So I just want you to write the formula. So the open top box is made from cutting small congruent squares from the corners of a 12 inch by 12 inch sheet of 10 and bending up the sides. 
So what's the volume in terms of X? So what would be the formula you would use in terms of X what, to calculate the volume of that? Can anyone tell me that? Would it be 144x? Uh, no. Let's back up. What's the formula in general for the volume of a box? Width times height times length. Length times width times height. See, see, I know how you're getting 144 because you're multiplying 12 by 12. But remember, we cut out these little x by x shapes. So now this dimension is not 12. When we fold it up, the length is not 12. But what is it? Wait, 12 uh, minus 144 minus 4x squared. Okay, you're getting closer. Oh, your, your problem there is your algebra. It, see, 12, 12 minus 2x is the length of each side. And when you square that, you don't get 144 minus 4x squared. It, you see your algebra is, is incorrect. What you're doing is it's, is it's 12 minus 2x, because this was 12, cut off the x and the x, so it's 12 minus 2x times 12 minus 2x times x, length times width times height, okay? So, that's it right there. 12 minus 2x squared times x, okay? Before class tomorrow, I want you to find V prime. So take the derivative of that. Take the derivative of this right here. And then we'll start there tomorrow. Um, because to optimize, we're going to have to take derivatives. Okay?